Wolf Trap Opera's production of La Pietra del Paragone took place at the Barnes of Wolf Trap in June 2017. The translation of Pietra del Paragone is the English word touchstone, and it's an actual translation. We don't use the word quite so much in modern English these days. It originally meant an actual physical black stone used to test the purity of gold and silver. The, uh, the metal, the gold or silver, would be struck against the stone, and depending on what kind of mark it left, one would be able to tell if it was true gold or silver. This has sort of morphed into our use of the word in modern English as a test for determining whether anything is true. This is indeed what happens in this opera. There's a plan rolled out that is a touchstone to determine whether someone's affection is true. I learned from our Italian coach that there is an actual uh, saying, proverb in Italian that has to do with the touchstone. And the English translation of it is that men have a touchstone used to test gold, but gold is really the touchstone that's used to test men. And of course, we can see that played out in our own time because still wealth and poverty are true tests of integrity. A little bit about our composer. Giochino Rossini. Uh, you typically think of him like this at the end of his career as a dignified, portly gentleman. He actually wrote this piece when he was 20 years old, looking much, much more like this instead. It had its premiere performances in Milan at La Scala in 1812. He ran for 53 performances, which at that time it was a record, and seven numbers had to be encored at the final performance. Uh, this was a record that wasn't bested until decades later, when Verdi's Nabucco, 30 years later, bested the record. The fame that Rossini gained from this opera was the beginning of his, uh, the big part of his career, and it was soon transformed into social success. He became quite the man about town, and his wit and charm became legendary. Most famously, uh, his fame got him exempted from military service. Napoleon's viceroy supposedly said that uh, we may be losing a mediocre soldier, but we are surely saving a man of genius. Rossini liked to say that he wrote performances rather than works, and that's important to us because uh, he was truly not writing for posterity, at least not at this time. He was writing for a public. He was writing for a public that wanted something very specific and that wanted something entertaining. He also said that uh, he felt that all kinds of music are valid except the boring kind, so he went to great lengths to, to, to please the public with his music. He was a great borrower. He borrowed from his past. There are excerpts in this piece from his previous opera, Le Quivico Stravagante. And of course, he also lent to himself so he could borrow from the future. This overture may sound familiar to you if you've ever heard Tancredi's overture, which is often played in concert. And the storm from this opera uh, is essentially the storm from the Barber Seville. I'd like to introduce our characters. And I'm going to start with the host at the party to which all of the characters on stage and we, the audience, have been invited. He is a count, and his name is Count Asdrubale. He's sung by bass baritone Richard Oyasaba in our production. And Richard was the one that told me about something called Joe Millionaire. It was an actual TV show that uh, ran on Fox uh, more than 10 years ago. And the conceit to Joe Millionaire is that basically there's a man who pretends to have a lot of money and women try to win his hand, kind of like in The Bachelor. And, uh, of course, it's only revealed at the very, very end. Of course, he has no money at all. As you can imagine, this show only ran for one season because after you sort of give up your premise, well, no one's going to want to be on it anymore. And there's not much of a stretch between that plot and the one for Rossini's opera. All the names in this opera uh, come from Italian history and, and lore and have uh, references that Italians would have understood at the time that takes some explaining to us at this point. Uh, Strubale comes from the name of a king and actually the name of, uh, also the name of several generals of the Punic Wars, and he was very easily identified to Italians uh, watching this opera as a man of leisure, a man who had a lot of money and was intent on holding on to it. Uh, it 
the costumes that we've made for this production. Uh, it's easy to see in Azdrubale's costumes that there are metallic flourishes that are, are signs of his status and echoes of the ideas of gold and silver from the touchstone. As I said, we've all been invited to a party. And when you meet the, the ensemble and the other characters, that's indeed what they're doing they're, during the overture. They're receiving their party invitations. And it is at this party that Azdrubale and his right-hand man, the servants Fabrizio, played in our production by bass Anthony Robin Schneider. The plan is to use the touchstone of adversity, in this case, poverty, to test the people around this rich man. Uh, and as they say in the libretto, fair weather friendship is truly worthless. The first Asdrubale was sung by Filippo Galli, who was quite a famous bass at the time, and he established the bass in this opera as a leading man, which was very, very unusual. Much more typically, the bass was sort of like a comic foil. Uh, but Galli was very, very important uh, in accepting this role because serious opera stars typically would not play in the comic operas. And his willingness to be in this comic opera by Rossini influenced him to, uh, to make this leading man a serious role and not a comic role. There's a scene at the end of Act One that became quite famous on its own in Milan at the time. Uh, during it, uh, Azdrubale makes up a crazy Italian phrases and words uh, and says again and again and again, sigillata, sigillata, seal it all up. Uh, he's talking about all of the possessions in Azdrubale's household that they're going to be confiscated uh, because he uh, is in debt. And this scene made such an impression in Milan that actually it lent a nickname to the whole opera, and they would call it Sigilara. So let's move on from our host, Azdrubale, and his servant Fabrizio to meeting one of the ladies. Uh, we'll call her bachelorette number one, but her real name is Claice. She is a rare uh, vocal bird, that of a con coloratura contralto. This is a, the lowest female voice and one that can actually move quite quickly uh, and sing a lot of notes in succession. Uh, she's sung by Zoe Reams. And again, here's the origin of the name. It's, uh, it comes from the Latin for bright and clear. And this might give you some hints as to her role in this plot. The character of Clarice has been called fierce and sincere but crafty, with intelligence and poise unknown to the pale soubrettes of traditional opera buffa, a reference, of course, to the fact that most of the leading ladies were, were high sopranos, but Rossini, for various reasons, preferred mezzos for many of his heroines. And one of those reasons was Maria Marcolini. She sang Clarice in the first production of this opera, and she went on to be Isabella in Rossini's Italian Girl in Algiers. She, prior to that, was the star of his Le Quibico Stravagante. Uh, she loved her, what was called her aria in travesti, we'd call it a trouser role. Uh, she had a, an opportunity in that previous opera to do a trouser role, to pretend to be, uh, to take on the guise of a male character as part of the comedy. She loved her travesti role in Le Quivico so much that she begged Rossini to use that device again in uh, Pietra, and indeed he did. Without her, Rossini could never have reached the pinnacle of La Scala so early in his career. Uh, she was very influential and she used, uh, through her weight behind the choice of, um, of this venue and worked with the impresario of La Scala to get Rossini's opera placed there. Uh, the two of them were professional colleagues and they were also lovers for a time during this period. And she was influential in a million different ways in Rossini's career. So Clarice and Asdrubale are a couple but they uh, dance around each other a lot, and they are reluctant to show uh, affection for their various reasons, but Clarice's reason is that she feels that it might seem opportunistic, of course. This is a wealthy man, uh, and she wants to make sure that he knows that she loves him for himself and not for his money. There is a best friend, and he is the tenor. His name is Giocondo. It's a coloratura tenor, again, a voice that sits quite high and moves quite fast. Alastair Kent sings Giocondo. His name comes from the Italian word for cheerful and smiling. And as I mentioned, he's as Drubale's close friend. He is a young poet uh, without vanity, very, very sincere, almost to a fault. And he's involved in a love triangle. Uh, he also loves Clarice, and that 
uh, lends to one of the primary tensions of the piece, this love triangle. So there is a journalist, and he's invited to the party too. He's very influential in this world. Um, Macrobio is his name, and he's sung by baritone Kihun Yun. Macrobio means a big ego, and indeed he has that. Our director, Lauren Meeker, said that she modeled this character from Rita Skeeter in Harry Potter, who said famously, uh, you don't care, do you? Anything for a story, and anyone will do, won't they? And that's Macrobio's motto too, uh, really um, no scruples. And he was quite uh, controversial. This was a joke on not only the atypical Italian journalist, but one particular journalist in Milan at the time, and the character that played this role actually uh, went to the trouble to get a costume that was the exact same costume as this uh, exact same suit that this particular Italian journalist wore. So it was very, very clear who they were referring to. He, uh, Macrobio in the plot refers to something that bears explaining. Again, Italian audiences at the time would have known this, but we don't necessarily. Uh, he refers to Angelica and Medoro. Uh, this is a, a famous story that was memorialized in this painting by Sebastiano Ricci, that the painting uh, was used significantly in our design for the show. Uh, and it comes from a 16th century Italian epic. And basically, it's a love triangle. Uh, Orlando loves Angelica, but she loves Medoro. And Orlando cannot accept this, and he is driven to madness. And of course, the parallels here are pretty clear. Orlando is as Drubale. He loves Clarice, but he thinks she doesn't love him. And uh, Clarice and Giocondo also have a relationship, and that begins to drive uh, as Drubale mad. On to Bachelorette number two and number three. Uh, Aspasia and Fulvia. They are, as our director said, in it to win it. They want, also, they want the hand of this very, very rich man. Uh, Donna Fulvia, sung by soprano Summer Hassan. Uh, Fulvia was a, a fairly common and famous name. Uh, again, uh, she was a very powerful woman, and uh, she was the first uh, Roman real woman, non-mythological, to appear on Roman coins. Uh, she gained access to her power through marriage to three of the most promising men of her generation. And there is a picture of uh, Donna Fulvia with the man who loves her, Pacuvio. And then uh, Baroness Aspasia is uh, dueling with her for Asdrubale's attention, sung by mezzo-soprano Megan Mikhailovna Samarin. And uh, again, Aspasia uh, refers to the name of a Greek woman whose house was an intellectual center in Athens, and she attracted prominent writers and thinkers to her salon, including the philosopher Socrates. Uh, she is pursued by the gentleman I just introduced a minute ago, the journalist Macrobio. Uh, I mentioned Bacuvio a second ago because he is connected to uh, Donna Fulvia. He's the final character that I'd like to introduce, sung by baritone Shay Owens. Uh, in our production, modeled on Shakespeare in Love. Uh, he is a poet, uh, not very good, but super dedicated to his art uh, in blind pursuit of beauty. He sings this uh, very silly opera uh, called Ombretta Sdegnosa del Missi PP. Uh, and it also, in addition to Sigillara, was a highlight of the, of the premiere triumph of this piece. I've now positioned you well to enjoy our streaming video. If you are watching this between September 2017 and March 2018, you'll be able to go to wolftrap.org slash streaming to see for free a full uh, video of this entire production. If you're catching this at a different time, uh, you should still be able to go to that um, address and see whichever opera from our seasons is streaming. There's one there at a time, and they go in a six-month rotation. So uh, I hope you enjoy that. And this is Kim Whitman signing off for Wolf Trap Opera. Thanks for listening to this uh, Touchstone pre-show talk. Mm -hmm.